Well, here we are. Welcome, welcome, uh, especially if you are with us for the first time today. It is uh, fantastic to have you here. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Steve. Give them a warm welcome. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sam. Um, City Light has been home for me for seven years now, I reckon. Uh, I met my now wife here, Renee, and uh, many of you will know her. She looks after our um, discipleship groups, and Renee's been here for nine years, I reckon now. Um, got family here. This is uh, my home. This is my family here at City Light. So um, it is awesome to be here, except for I am horribly nervous. Um, <laughs> And um, if it isn't your first week, you'll know that we have been working our way through the uh, Nijay Gupta's book, The 15 Words, um, and I have been uh, chored with the task of speaking on peace, and um, which is funny because there hasn't been a great deal of peace this week in preparing for it, um, just more grey hairs, which isn't a bad thing, is it, Dave Batchelor? Um, but... Um, there are many things uh, we could speak today on peace and um, how are we supposed to only speak for half an hour or so on something um, as quintessential to the Christian faith um, like peace. Um, again, we could cover, there's so much, it's such a broad topic as are all these 15 words, um, but today I want to spend our time together um, not speaking on the subject of peace, but looking at the object of our peace. And uh, what do I mean by this? Um, well, if peace is something that Jesus has gifted us with for here and for now, then uh, what is it? What is peace? Um, how do we get it? And then what do we do with it? Um, I think we need to pray, actually, before we get any further. So let's pray together. Pray for me and pray for us um, together now. Uh, Heavenly Father, again, um, it is wonderful to be in your house. It is wonderful to be amongst family. We thank you, Lord, that you call us family, that you have called us to yourself, that we are your sons and daughters, and that you are loving and merciful and gracious. And it is by your grace that we are here today. And um, by that same grace, Lord, I ask that you would help us now. Help me. Um, help me to uh, speak clearly. Help uh, me to... Um, identify uh, throughout your scriptures, Lord, um, what it is that we can come to know deeper about your peace. And um, yeah, help us as we journey through this together today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, everyone doing all right? You're happy, Mark? Sweet. I'm happy. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> this is going to help me get through today, a little bit of engagement, if you don't mind. Jesus speaking in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus speaking. Uh, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. Now, if we were to head to the streets of Adelaide in 2023 and ask the general population uh, what their idea of peace was, we may get some different answers um, if we were to head to the streets, say, of Kiev or Myanmar or the Congo. But there would be some form of consensus in that peace would have to involve the eradication of war and violence. Uh, it would have to be the absence of conflict uh, and political and civil unrest. And on a much more new age and alt-left uh, sort of scale... Uh, inner personal peace would have to involve a lot of self-love at oneness, such as this mantra post that I saw recently. It says this, I release myself from my guilty feelings. I am at peace with my decisions. I know and understand myself better than anyone. I love myself and all of my choices. Or maybe if you fancied some prosperity gospel type TV from a certain Houston megachurch, you might get a quote a little along the lines of, empty out the worry and God will fill you with peace. So how does one find peace in this chaotic cacophony of hustling and bustling of life pursuits? Do we seek solitude at the holiday house or head away to a meditation retreat? Do we follow more self-love experts on social media? Do we change our display pictures to the Ukrainian flag? 
Do we follow more self-help experts? Do we uh, engage in peaceful protests? All of these can be fantastic things. But the Western world, not us in here obviously, the rest of the Western world, want the subject of peace without going through the source of peace. Now as been uh, looking at throughout this series, when we read the Bible, we don't want to read into Scripture. We don't want our ever-changing and progressive societal norms and ideals to affect the way that we read God's Word. We want to understand the authors of the original text, what they are wanting to convey, what the social context of the days were, and what is it that God would have us know and understand more about His character in each passage. So... As we've been doing throughout this series, in Nijay Gupta's book, we'll be reading from Scripture to help us better understand a word like peace. Now, unfortunately, as you're all aware, the English language falls horribly short of accurately, um, accurately translating uh, the original Hebrew and Greek. As you'll find out in a few, word, in a few weeks, uh, the Greek have six words for the English word the English language only having one, which we all throw under the banner of love. But there aren't as many for peace. There are two, really. One in Hebrew, shalom, and in Greek, arene. I'm sorry about that pronunciation, Chris. Thank you. Now, shalom is translated as completeness or wholeness. And shalom can refer to a stone with a perfect whole shape and no cracks, Or it can refer to a perfect stone wall with no gaps or missing bricks. It can refer to something complex with lots of pieces and it is in a state of completeness and wholeness. Now we see throughout scripture that peace is certainly multifaceted. Job references peace in talking about his tents, his home, being in a state of shalom because nothing is missing. And when the shepherd David visits his brothers at the battlefield, he inquires about their shalom, their well-being. So we certainly see the Bible does speak on things like our personal disposition, uh, our manner, our psychological peace. And it also speaks on our social peace, the lack of hostility politically and internationally. But these things are not the source of our peace, the objectivity of our peace. They actually can't be the kind of peace that Jesus is referencing in John. Everyone okay? Good. It cannot be political or international peace. So if you were sitting in the lunchroom at work and somehow or another the topic of peace comes up and you chime in with, well, Jesus actually came to bring us political and international peace, then your workmates, unchurching, may be sitting there going, well, Wars and violence have been unceasing for thousands of years, so that would rightly question the validity of that claim that Jesus came to bring us international and political peace. Jesus literally says in Luke 21, don't be alarmed regarding wars and rebellions, but rather expect them. It cannot be political and international peace. Neither can this peace be psychological or internal or inner peace. Again, Jesus speaking in Luke 12, verse 49, Do you think I've come to bring peace? No. I have come to bring division. Father against son, mother against daughter. Doesn't sound promising, does it? But you see, the the internal, the inner peace that God certainly can and does provide us with is a relative peace. It has to flow out of something. That's why the promise of follow God and all your fears and anxieties will float away is not biblical. Keller says about this verse, when Jesus comes into your life, things get messy, not easy. Jesus came to bring us something concrete and specific. So, we'll look at the key texts for the day. Hebrews, two verses, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Verse 14. Look in the NLT if you want to follow along at home. Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. 
Let's look at what this is saying. Verse 14. The author of Hebrews says, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. Now, why did Jesus need to become flesh and blood? How could God not have come up with an alternative means of removing the curse of sin and therefore the sting of death without the Son taking the form of flesh and blood? Well, there are multiple reasons why he had to take the form of man, but regarding our topic and in particular this passage today, he did so in order that he would fulfill the law's requirements and therefore accomplish between, he would accomplish peace between us and God. Jesus speaking in Matthew, Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. From the beginning of time, man's sin issue prevented us nearing the presence of God. So humans are complex. We are, our lives are full of moving parts and pursuits and relationships. Adam and Eve, they had uh, one tree they couldn't eat from. They had one relationship they needed to maintain. If their shalom breaks down just three pages into this thing, then how the heck are we supposed to balance all the spinning plates we love to fill our lives with? So let's look for a minute back to Genesis, back to the beginning, when sin enters the world. Anti-peace. Our shalom breaks down. So what does God do? He assembles a people who would bring peace to a tumultuous world. He creates a covenant with this selected nation, Israel, in order to shape them into a microcosm of divine peace and harmony. Their land would be fertile and healthy. They would be without hunger and thirst. And as Leviticus 26, verse 5 puts it, they shall live securely in their land. Actually, the whole chapter of Leviticus 26 is littered with promises of a land that looks a lot like Eden. But there remains this great problem of this great divide between the sinful and fallen state of man and a completely perfect and most holy God. So much so that man can by no means enter into the presence of our holy God. We see this in the first chapter of Leviticus when God speaks to Moses from the tent of meaning, showing that Moses cannot enter in due to God's holiness. Now, besides the fact that I'm grossly underqualified to provide a clear and in-depth overview of the book of Leviticus, uh, and we just don't have the time, I don't know how I'm going for time, I think we're doing all right, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It is important for us to understand that through Leviticus 27 chapters, it outlays uh, these specific detailed rituals, feasts, ordinations, purifications and sacrifices. And the book is centred around the Day of Atonement, where once a year the high priest would take two goats, one of which would be a purification offering, where the blood of this goat would be sprinkled throughout the... um, throughout the temple to atone for the sins of the people and uh, to cover over the sins of the people. And the other would be called the scapegoat, where the high priest would confess the sins of, this pe- of the people on this goat symbolically and then would cast it out to the wilderness. This is very specific and powerful symbolism of God's desire to remove sin and its consequences from his people. What does this book of Leviticus show? Well, like the macro narrative of the Bible, it shows that God is holy, loving and merciful and continually makes a way for us to be in his presence. As then we see in the first uh, chapter of Numbers, the Lord speaks to Moses in the tent of meeting. God had made a way for them to enter into his presence. How? Because the Israelites were brought back into Shalom with God. Now, skimming over the next thousand years or so, we see this habitual, cyclical nature of the Israelites rebelling, pursuing self, breaking down their shalom with God time and time again, only to receive mercy all the more. Until God finally puts on the display, puts on display the greatest show of peacemaking in coming down to us. Enter the word became flesh. God has always been about reconciling his people to himself. And Jesus is our perfect high priest and was our necessary perfect sacrifice. 
required by law not to do away with the law but to fulfill it to make peace with God for us for once and for all time Paul writes in Romans since our friendship was God with God sorry was restored by the death of his son while we were still enemies we will certainly be saved through the life of his son the next line in our passage says for only as a human being could he die Spurgeon says on this, We know that had he only been God, yet still he would not have been fitted for a perfect saviour, unless he had become man. Man had sinned, man must suffer. It was man in whom God's purposes had been for a while defeated. It must be in the man in man that God must triumph over his great enemy. Again, Christ became flesh, fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law and therefore secured us eternal peace with God the Father. Next line. We doing all right? And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had, past tense, the power of death. So Jesus freely laid down his life in order that we would have peace with God. In doing so, Jesus has secured this atonement for us, this covering over of sin. He has provided at one with our Heavenly Father, taking us not just from deficit to neutral, but taking us from insurmountable deficit to everlasting life. We are adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High, and Jesus is our big brother who does not just bring us peace, he is our peace. Verse 15 Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Matthew Henry's commentary on this is excellent. It reads like this. It may refer to all the people, on on verse 15, this is what he's saying. It may refer to all the people of God, whether under the Old Testament or the New, whose minds are often in perplexing fears about fear, uh, sorry, perplexing fears about death and eternity. Christ became man and died to deliver them from those perplexities of soul by letting them know that death is not only a conquered enemy but a reconciled friend, not sent to hurt the soul or separate it from the love of God but to put an end to all their grievances and complaints and to give them a passage to eternal life and blessedness so that to them death is not now in the hand of Satan but in the hand of Christ, not Satan's servant but Christ's servant has not hell following it but heaven to all who are in Christ. How does one reconcile death without Christ's overcoming of death? I really don't know what someone uh, clings to and holds to in those times of losing a loved one. And as a lot of you would know, uh, Dad, my dad passed away earlier this year. And in reflecting with Mum recently on how we both experienced peace during that time, Peace didn't void us of our suffering. It guided us through it. And C.S. Lewis summarises this perfectly. C.S. Lewis quote, he says, Life with God is not immunity from difficulties, but peace in difficulties. And peace really is a wonderful thing to pray for someone to experience in that kind of time of grief and uncertainty, etc. But our relative peace flows out of our objective peace out of the knowledge of our wholeness and harmony with a loving, merciful Creator God. See, for me, my internal peace came from knowing that Dad had perfect peace with God the Father. And a couple of weeks after his passing, standing at Glenelg on a Sunday evening in worship, hands raised, eyes closed, picturing Dad standing in the presence of the Almighty, hands raised, worshipping also, That is wonderful peace that again is made possible through the peace that Jesus' blood has purchased for me, for Dad and for all of us who call him Saviour. So what does this mean for us? What do we do with this peace, this arena that Christ came to provide for us? Well, like always, we want to follow in the example of our big brother and Jesus himself calls us to this in the Beatitudes He says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. 
If God has reconciled himself to us through Christ, how can we too not pursue reconciliation with others? A key learning for me in the early stages of marriage was the difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. Now, believe it or not, Renee and I argue. But not, not about the insequential things in life. We argue on the weighty matters of life, the most important things, such as which end to squeeze the toothpaste tube. <laughs> and for those of you who are married, you will know when you leave your house and married, now living with your spouse, that there are all these things in which you thought weren't done that way. And early on in marriage, the toothpaste tube was one of these things. And rather than saying something, I would just, I'm not, I don't like conflict, right? So I would not say anything and I would allow all of these things build and they would create resentment and they would end up coming out in this burst of anger. Why do you squeeze the toothpaste from the bottom? From the top, from the top, from the top. Why don't you squeeze it? People were worried there. People were like, why do you, why do you squeeze it from the top? And then it would create this conflict. There's a grave difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. We want to pursue peacemaking. Now, luckily, I ran this uh, sermon past mum yesterday, and she read it to Nana. And, of course, then I get recommendations, last-minute additions. But I love this from Nana, 1 Peter 3.10. 1 Peter 3.10 says... For the one who wants to love life and to see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit, and let him turn away from evil and do what is good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. And Gupta in the book actually finishes this chapter with three pages on how we can be peacemakers while engaging in social media. Yeah. So when we engage in social media, are we practicing empathy? Are we loving one another as brothers and sisters? Are we attending to the outsider? Are we fact-checking? I think we all have someone, speaking with Harold about this, it was, it was quite funny. We all have someone on our social media, no matter what we post, will feel the need to post argumentatively with something quite left of field, potentially um, whatever it might be, whatever crazy sort of conspiracy we're thinking but when we, when we cocoon ourselves with only following like-minded thinkers, like if we only read the like-minded stuff, then how can we be challenged with what we're thinking? We want to think critically. We don't want to cocoon ourselves with only like-minded thinkers. So do engage that online. And are we imitating the best in our social media interaction? And obviously this applies to all areas of life. Another thing it reminds me of is, is I, I, in the last couple of years, I've moved into an office role and um, this thing of emails I, I never had to deal with while on the tools. And also, um, all these people unnecessarily copied into an email. I remember speaking with Dylan about this a, a few months back and um, I would do something wrong, I'd make a mistake and this friend of mine, actually, I've known for years, very funny man, he, rather than picking up the phone... He will feel the need to email me, pointing out my error, but also copy in 10 to 12 other people. Let's not be that person. So as we meet in our DGs this week, I'd encourage us all uh, to commit to an area of your life where we want to make a deliberate effort to be about peacemaking. And if you're not in a DG, I would encourage you even more to um, have a chat with Renee afterwards and find out a DG that you can, you can become a part of. Um, because, again, going to the start of the year um, with what we went through with Dad's passing, uh, we wouldn't have wanted to have gone through that. I wouldn't want to know, uh, trying to deal with the grief of that without the support and encouragement and prayers of our DGs and our church family. So please, if you're not in a DG, like seek one out. This is what John Piper says about peacemaking. God is a peace-loving God and a peacemaking God. 
The whole history of redemption, climaxing in the death and resurrection of Jesus, is God's strategy to bring about a just and lasting peace between rebel man and himself, and then between man and his fellow man. God's children have the character of their father. What he loves, they love. What he pursues, they pursue. You can know his children by whether they are willing to make sacrifices for peace the way that God did. And by the sovereign work of God's grace, rebel human, rebel human beings are born again and brought from rebellion to faith and made into children of God. We were given a new nature after the image of our Heavenly Father. If He is a peacemaker, then we, His children, who have His nature, will be peacemakers too. Paul writes in Romans 12, Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Peacemaking, again, is multifaceted, but the key idea remains... We want to be about restoring what is broken, not adding to it. So, in conclusion, the great perk of this new job that I have in the office is actually that I get to drive around town for a day or two a week, listen to different podcasts. My DG guys know how much I love pods. If you have any good recommendations, please let me know. But I was uh, listening to a couple of pods recently uh, in preparation for this uh, discussion today and I listened to a couple of these uh, secular like self-help uh, sort of pods and one interview with this um, Shannon Kaiser is this person's name. She is a world-renowned uh, spiritual and self-love teacher and when asked how uh, she and others might experience uh, inner peace, this was her exact rep- response. She said this, You can connect to the light that is available to you at any single moment and that light is this benevolent force of loving energy, source energy. See, people try and search for the subject of peace without going through the object of peace. And this world is manic and frantic and complex and no matter the world view, humanity understands its need for peace. And this is what makes Christianity unique. It offers not just peace, but objective peace. Objective peace in a real, compassionate, loving, personal saviour. If we flick down to the final verse, 18, of this chapter 2, it says this, Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. He understands what we go through. This is the beauty of Christ coming down to us and taking on human form. He can now empathise with what we go through. Everything we feel, he felt. He experienced praise and criticism, loyalty and betrayal, love and rejection, to feel close to the Father and to be forsaken. There is peace in knowing that we can pray to a God who knows exactly what it is that we are going through and has been through it himself. And not only been through it, but passed every test we could never pass. And then he has imputed that perfection to us, bringing us wholeness and harmony with our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, are, we thank you mightily for this peace that you have given us in our perfect big brother in Jesus. We thank you that This is peace in which we can never obtain through whatever life pursuit we might throw at it, Lord. But you have gifted us with this. Help us this week, Lord, to be about considering how we might be making peace in our day-to-day lives, Lord, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our relationships. Help us, Father, to go considering how we might be more like your Son, in making peace in our lives. We thank you for this. We pray that you would help us. In Jesus' name, amen.